dude there. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. We will finish chapter 5 today. <clears throat> It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that you would help me today to preach, to proclaim the truth that we come to today concerning the marriage relationship. Father, give us great grace so that in our marriages that we might glorify your name. Be with me now, Father. Be with everyone who has ears. Give them ears to hear. And maybe we'll be changed by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we, um, as you all know, we preach expositionally. We preach sequentially through whole books of the Bible. We miss nothing. We hit every good point, every hard point, everything. And this is one that I've known has been coming, obviously, for a long time. So here we are, instructions for a godly home, instructions for a godly home. So just as a reminder, right, the first half of Ephesians 1 through 3 is is doctrine. It's the teaching of the book. And then as we turned into chapter 4, we began with the application of the book. And, And Paul has declared to us the unity of the church, right, how we are united in Christ and given gifts and abilities for the purpose of building up his church in love in the first half of chapter 4. He's called for us to leave behind who we once were and be renewed in the spirit of our minds, putting on the new man, right? Paul has called for us in chapter 5 to, to, to be imitators of God, right? We do so by walking in love. We do so by walking in light. We do so by walking in in wisdom, right? And then a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were commanded to be filled with the Spirit, right? With the result of which is joyful song, uh, thankful hearts to God, right? As well as uh, submission to one another, right? As we, as we seek to be obedient to what Paul said, that we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Right. This submission that looks like coming under one another in accountability. Understanding that Christ dwells in us, in our members, and so we submit to one another. Right. These are the prerequisites of a godly home. These are the prerequisites of a godly home. A Holy Spirit filled home is a godly home. And so Paul has dealt with the church He's dealt with the individual, and now he shifts focus to the home, beginning with marriage, the marriage relationship. All right, there's no greater human relationship than marriage. None. 
For in it, the mystery of Christ and his church is revealed. Because of that revelation, there's no relationship attacked greater than marriage by the evil one. Satan has gone to great lengths to confuse and distort this union in every way possible. So much um, that the world sees this relationship as disposable. That's quite obvious, right? That marriage is seen as disposable by the world, and and for for many, it's no more than a means of a just as a way to save on taxes. But what does God say about marriage? The Bible records the creation of marriage in Genesis two twenty three and twenty four. The man said, "This is now bone of my bone." Flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And it's for this reason that a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. As she was taken from that man, flesh and bone, so a man leaves his husband, clings to his wife, and they are one flesh by design. God created man and then made woman to complement him. In the Bible, marriage is God's fix for the fact that it is not good for man to be alone, according to Genesis 2.18. As the Bible describes the first marriage, it uses the word helper to identify Eve. In 2.20, God created Eve to come alongside Adam as his other half, to be his aid and his helper. The Bible says that marriage causes a man and a woman to become one flesh, and this oneness is manifested most fully in the physical union of intimacy. Right? The New Testament adds a warning regarding this oneness in Matthew 19, 6. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33 is the longest section of instructions for marriage. In it, we see instructions for wives. In it, we see instructions for husbands. And how Christ is glorified in our union with one another. So first, instructions for wives. Uh, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. It says, when wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Right? This is the command to submit. Right? Pastor, uh, Pastor James dealt with this providentially last week. It's the same word. Right to obey, to be obedient, to come underneath, to be submissive to, to uh, be put in subjection. Uh, Pastor James used the uh, the picture of of a soldier who would come under the authority of a higher ranking official, putting himself willingly under the submission of the authority. Right, and notice this is to your own husbands. Right, nor in the Bible does it say women are to submit to men. In a broad sense, but it's wives submit to your own husbands. Submit here. This word is, as James brought out again last week, it's 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 the same context. It's present tense. Right. Which means that it's continual. It's it's not a command to submit as though I said I do. I'm good. Right? It's not a one-time thing. To be a present in the present tense means it is to be continual, a continual submission. Submit is also in the passive form, passive meaning voluntary. Right? It's, it's, what, it's what's being emphasized in verse 21 as we submit to one another in the reverence of, of Christ, in the fear of the Lord. It's, it's a voluntary submission. In other words, Paul says that a wife is to submit willingly and voluntarily to her husband. 
But nowhere does it say that husbands are to demand submission from their wives because they shouldn't have to. Husbands, you should pray earnestly for your wives, uh, understanding how difficult this command can be. This is a difficult command for wives. And, And listen to what God said after the fall. When man sinned, and as a result of that sin, God came and spoke to the serpent, to the woman, and to the man. And listen to what he said to the woman uh, in Genesis 3.16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he should rule over you. Because of the fall and sin entering the earth, the man and the woman will face struggles in their own relationship. Uh, Sin has turned the harmonious system of God-ordained roles into struggles of self-will. Lifelong companions, husbands and wives, will need God's help in getting along as a result. The woman's desire will be contrary to her husband but the husband will rule by divine design as God has planned it, right? Uh, Paul offers a comparison to submitting to your husbands here. Uh, He says, as to the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, this is your motivation for submitting to your husbands. When a wife voluntarily submits to her husband, she is simultaneously submitting to the Lord. Right. And why should the wife submit? Look at verse 23, for the husband is the head of his wife. Right? A wife should submit to her husband because God has placed the husband in a role of authority over his wife. Paul is obviously not basing this off cultural and societal norms. That, that's not the norm in society. Right. He is basing this off of the God appointed leadership role given to the husband. First Corinthians 10, I'm sorry, 11 and three says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Right. So submission here does not imply uh, inherent inferiority. Now, it's not to say that women or wives are inferior to their husbands. That is not at all the case. It's about what God has appointed. There is no inferiority, right? Christ is equal in status to the Father, but willingly submitted Himself to the Father, right? And we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's 28, when all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all things in subjection under Him that God may be all in all. Right? Jesus, who is equal in essence with the Father, has willingly submitted Himself to His Father. In the same way, Women are equal in value and worth to men because both are created in God's image. But based on God's design, men and women assume different roles in the marriage relationship. And that's why Paul here is drawing another comparison. He says, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Right. Christ is the head of his body, the church, as we learned back in chapter four. Right? His body. And is himself its savior. The MacArthur Study Bible says, according to the this note, its savior. As the Lord delivered his church from the dangers of sin, death, and hell, so the husband provides for, protects, preserves, and loves his wife, leading her to blessing as she submits. Right? Some might think. What if my husband isn't being obedient to the word? What if my husband isn't even a believer? Listen to first Peter, chapter three, one through six. Peter says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands 
so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Right? So what is submission not? Submission does not mean, according to this text, agreeing with everything your husband says. Right? This wife in 1 Peter 3 believes Jesus is Lord and obeys the word and her husband does not. Right? And I'm, I'm grateful that my wife doesn't agree with everything I say. It's kept us out of a lot of trouble. Right? We compliment one another. Submission doesn't mean agreeing with everything. Submission does not mean trying to change your husband in this context. Right? The wife in 1 Peter 3 is trying to convert him through a godly life. It does not mean uh, that a wife gets spiritual strength from her husband. Right? The woman had a disobedient husband. And she drew her strength from the Lord. Right? Submission... is understanding the God-given role that God has given to husbands and bringing ourselves in obedience to Christ by coming under the submission of the God-ordained role He has given your husband. Right, Verse 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Again, submission means to willingly bring yourself under the authority of another. Just as the church willingly submits to Christ, so also should wives freely and willingly submit to their own husbands. He says in everything. Right? And that's not that's not absolute concerning matters that are sinful, harmful or contrary to what God's commands are. But it's in everything, right? The point and the focus is on the importance of the wife's willing submission to the leadership of her husband. It is your husband who will stand before Christ to give account for the role he has been given. Which brings us to an even greater weightiness on the husbands. Instructions for husbands. Verse 25 through 31 it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Paul has much more to say to husbands than wives. So buckle up, men. Right? The command to wives is to submit to their husbands. Naturally, one might think that if the wife is to submit then the command to men must be to rule over them. That's not the case. That's not the command. Right? The command to husbands is to love their wives. And some might be tempted to think, well, that's easy. I love my wife. Right? That's easy. I love my wife. But there are multiple words for love in the Greek Right, and here he's not talking about eros, a romantic love. He's he's not talking about storage, which refers to family love, such as a brother loves a sister. He's not referring to philia, which means to a devoted friendship or camaraderie. The word love here in the Greek is agape. 
And it means to show love or demonstrate love. There's action involved. It's used to express God's love for us. This is not a surface level, I love you, right? This this is a deep, deep seated love that is first sacrificial, second sanctifying, and third satisfying. And we'll see that in the, in the remainder here. Verse uh, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a sacrificial love. Paul sees Christian marriage as an illustration of the relationship between Christ and his church. If the husband makes Christ's love for the church the pattern for loving his wife, then he will love her sacrificially. Notice that it doesn't command the wife to love in this text. Rather, the inception, maintenance, and growth of love are the responsibility of the husband. And why is that? 1 John 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us. We, the church, love because he, Christ, first loved us. In this regard, we are to love as Christ gave himself for his church. And how do we do that? How did Christ do that? Right, Galatians 1, 3, and 4 is, opens up by Paul saying, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Christ gave. Right? Husbands are to be giving. Providers for their home. Praise God for reliable, faithful men in this church. I don't have to worry about getting beat up after church, I don't think. We have men that are providers for their home. Right? The sacrificial love of a husband in action is to provide, protect, and care for your wife. Right? And, and many of us, you know, would think, you know, I'll protect my wife. It's a mess of my life. I'll throw a pounding on them. Right? And it's easy to think that way, but how difficult is it to protect her heart? To protect her heart from our own words and from our own actions and from our own lack of care, from our own selfishness. Right? We're to care for our wives. So when you get home, get after the honeydew list. Show that sacrificial love. That's caring for your wife, right? And, And how often I fell in just listening to my wife. Caring for my wife by hearing her heart. We get busy. We got stuff to do outside and this and that, as do they. And how easy is it to care for our, to forget to care for our wives by just hearing our wives, listening to our wives and caring for the needs of their heart. We must care for our wives. We must love sacrificially by giving of ourselves. Second, love is sanctifying. The love of Christ is sanctifying. And our love is to be a sanctifying love. It says in verse 26, that he might sanctify her, that is Christ, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that, the, the, that she might be holy and without blemish. Word, the, the, the word sanctify means set apart, to set apart. Right? The, in the marriage ceremony, the husband is set apart to belong to the wife, and the wife is set apart to belong to the husband, and any interference with this God-given arrangement is sin. Because we are consecrated, that's another word for it, we are sanctified to one another. Right? 
Men, Christ is our example. Today, Christ is sanctifying His church through the ministry of the Word. Jesus said in John 15, 3, Already you are clean because of the Word that I have spoken to you. John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. The love of the husband for his wife ought to be cleansing her and him so that both are becoming more like Christ. Even their physical relationship should be so controlled by God that it becomes a means of spiritual enrichment as well as personal enjoyment. As we are both being sanctified by the Word of God. right? Husbands, are, are you being ruled by the Word of God yourselves? In order to love in a cleansing way, you must dig into the Word in order to lead your family through every circumstance, to encourage your bride with the Word, and to seek direction for the path that you are both on together in the Word, right? And make sound decisions in your marriage from the Word of God, right? Christ has set apart His church and cleanses her. A husband also should love his wife in a manner that she knows she is set apart. That he belongs to her. She belongs to him. The husband is not to use his wife for his own pleasure, but rather is to show the kind of love that is mutually rewarding and sanctifying. The marriage experience is one of constant growth. When Christ is the Lord of the home, sacrificial Sanctifying love always, always enlarges and enriches, while selfishness does just the opposite. Selfish tears apart. Selfish sets us back. Selfishness does not allow the other to think that we are set apart. But a sanctifying love enriches and brings us together in Christ and one another. Right? The church today is not perfect. It has spots and wrinkles. Spots are caused by defilement on the outside, while wrinkles are caused by decay on the inside. As we decay, we get wrinkles. Because the church becomes defiled by the world, it needs constant cleansing. And the Word of God is that cleansing agent. Right? James preached a while back in James 127, it tells us to keep ourselves unstained from the world. Right? But we do become defiled in some ways, and daily we are cleansed by the word of God. Right? Every day. As we go to the word, as, as we pray to the Lord, He cleanses us day by day, cleanses our defilements, cleanses all of our sins. As we look to Him, as we look to His Word, we are being renewed day by day by the Spirit in the Word. Wrinkles being a sign of internal decay shouldn't be present in the church as the Word of God is continually cleansing us on the inside, right? When churches depart from the Word, they do look wrinkled. Right? This, is a, this is a reality today. There are many churches that are just dying because they haven't followed the Word. The church ought to be clean as the Spirit of God sanctifies us through the Word of God And one day the church will be presented in heaven, a glorious church at the coming of Jesus Christ. Right? This agape love is a sanctifying love. And and third, love is satisfying. Uh, Verses starting in 28, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In the marriage relationship, the husband and wife, as we saw in Genesis 2, they become one flesh. Therefore, 
Whatever each does to the other, he does to himself or herself. Right? And any of you husbands ever hurt your wife's feelings and immediately you knew that was dumb? And then you're broken hearted because your wife is broken hearted? Or, or perhaps you've done something that brought your wife much pleasure and then you are pleased because she is pleased? You hurt when she hurts. You're joyful when she's joyful. One flesh. We are one flesh. The man who loves his wife is actually loving his own body since he and his wife are one flesh. As he loves her, he nourishes her. Just as love is the circulatory system of the body of Christ, as we saw in Ephesians 4.16, so love is the nourishment of the home. This responsibility falls on husbands. Warren Wiersbe says, there should be no starvation for love in the Christian home. For the husband and wife should so love each other that their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs are met. If both are submitted to the Lord and to each other, they will be so satisfied that they will not be tempted to look anywhere else for fulfillment. Our Christian homes are to be pictures of Christ's relationship to his church. Each believer is a member of Christ's body, and each believer is to help nourish the body in love. We are one with Christ. The church is his body and his bride, and the Christian home is a divinely ordained illustration of the relationship. And this certainly makes marriage a critical matter. It is an illustration of this divine ordained picture of Christ and his church. Right? It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Paul is appealing to the creation account in Genesis 2 here. Again, right? The man Adam had to give up a piece of himself to get a wife. God opened his side in order to give him a wife. Therefore, they are one flesh. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Paul is instructing us as husbands and wives here in order to show us the glory of Christ that is revealed in a godly marriage. And lastly, we see Christ glorified in marriage. Look at verse 32 and 33. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Again, Adam had to give part of himself in order to get a bride, but Christ gave all of himself to purchase his bride on the cross. God opened Adam's side, but sinful men pierced Christ's side. Jesus was perfect, unlike you and I, without sin, yet tried as guilty, beaten and placed on a cross between two thieves in humiliation, in obedience to his Father, because he was sinless, the sacrifice was sufficient to purchase you and I out of our original condition. That was spiritual death in Ephesians 2. By faith, his punishment paid our ransom, and his righteousness is counted to us, his church, and that is love. The glorious Christ has made a way. In the previous verses, we were instructed to be filled with the Spirit. To experience the fullness of the Spirit, a person must first possess the Spirit. They must be a Christian. right? Then there must be a sincere desire to glorify Christ, since this is why the Holy Spirit was given. And we don't use the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit uses us. There must be, we must thirst for God's fullness, for the fullness of the Spirit. Right? We must confess Christ and we need the power of God to do so. 
Right? Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. By faith, we yield ourselves to Christ. By faith, we ask him for the fullness of the spirit. By faith, we receive. And when we find ourselves joyful, thankful and submissive, we know that God has answered our cry. Verse 33 says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that the, she respects her husband. Again, how critical is this command? Husbands, love your wife. Wives, respect and, and, and submit to your husband because this displays a profound mystery. Right? That which was hidden in the Old Testament now has been revealed concerning Christ and His church. Your marriage is to be a picture of the divine marriage between Christ and His church. God created human marriage so that we would have a category for understanding the relationship between Christ and His church. And notice in this text that there are no conditions placed upon these commands. None. That means husbands... You love your wives regardless of whether she willingly submits to your leadership. Wives, you submit to your husbands regardless of whether he is loving you as Christ loves the church. There are no conditions. We do so in obedience to Christ. Both the foundation and the goal of marriage are based on the relationship of Christ to his church. He loves her. sacrificed himself for her. He sanctifies her. He cleanses her, nourishes her, and loves her, cherishes her, and he will present her blameless. God's primary intention for creating the institution of marriage was to illustrate his love for the church. There are several reasons that God created marriage. Procreation. He saw that man needed a helpmate. Right? There are several reasons that God created marriage, but perhaps none greater than the illustration it provides of Christ's relationship to his church. It shows what male headship is supposed to look like as Christ lays down his life for his bride. When he takes upon himself the sins of his people and suffers the punishment due to their sin so that their sins may be imputed to him and his righteousness imputed to his bride so that in this double imputation he can atone for their sins, save them from their sins, and grant them eternal life into the perfect unity of the Trinity. Christ died for sin once for all and just for the unjust in order that he could bring us back to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is what marriage is a picture of. Therefore, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your husband as the church submits to Jesus Christ. As Jesus, equal in status to the Father, willingly submits to the Father. This is the command from God, and we must strive to fulfill it. Because this illustrates the glory of Christ and his relationship to his church. We're going to fall short. All right, this was tough to work out. Right? Because we fall short. We must strive to fulfill these commands. But when we do fall short, repent. And find comfort in these words. In the end, Christ will present you his church blameless before God. Amen. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you for your word. And on the surface, this seems like it should be some easy task, but we know that it is no simple task. And I pray that you would give us as husbands and wives great grace because your glory is at stake. May our lives and our marriages bring glory to Christ and the relationship of Christ to his church. May it be clearly seen. May we be examples to those that we are around on a daily basis. And may people come to us and ask, what is the reason for our hope that we might give account to the, your great name? Father, I pray for every husband here that you would give him a great desire to love his wife in a sacrificial way in a sanctifying, cleansing way, and in a way that is satisfying as they are both are one flesh. Father, I pray for every wife that you would give them great grace in submitting to their husbands and bringing themselves under the God-given authority that you have given. And that in these marriage relationships, Father, you would cause them to complement one another as they discuss and work through the issues of everyday life. May they honor and respect one another, love one another. And may your glory be seen to every child as they look to their parents. Bless your people. Give us grace and be glorified in and through your church. In Jesus' name, amen.